All right, so Sunday Times journalist David Walsh's latest book is released today. It's called The Russian Affair, the true story of the couple who uncovered the greatest sporting scandal. It is the story of Yulia and Vitaly Stepanova, the Russian whistleblowers who helped reveal the true extent of state-sponsored doping in Russia. And David Walsh, I'm delighted to say, is on the line to talk about the book. Evening, David. Good evening, there is a lot of fascinating and pretty shocking details in this book about how Russian sport works. And to be honest, it's not the book I was expecting to read when I heard you were doing a book on Russian doping. I thought it would be just on that from top to bottom. This feels like a far more personal book. It's very much about this couple who changed the world in many ways, changed the sporting world to very, in many ways, ordinary Russians whose bravery revealed the greatest sporting scandal in history. Is that the book you wanted it to be? Is it the book you set out for it to be? Well, as much as you might have been slightly confounded by what you read, Nathan, I was confounded by the story I was told because I thought I was going into a Russian doping story and I was hoping it would have elements of a, a Russian doping thriller. And I think it has, especially at that climactic moment when they're trying to accumulate all the evidence and escape mm. Russia, you know, leaving a hotel at, at half four or five o'clock in the morning to, so nobody will see them leave. That stuff is there. But what confounded me was what confounded you, was I start talking to Vitaly about his marriage to Yulia and he starts telling me what it was like. And suddenly um, he's confronting me with the story that I'm thinking, you know, can we really write this? Can we write that, that you meet, you know, she's a doper, you're an anti-doping guy. She's not compromising her position, you're not compromising yours. Well, why go ahead and get married then, especially two months after you meet? But they do that. Now, he doesn't realize she's in a relationship with mm. her coach at this time. She's not prepared to give up that relationship. So she cheats on him during the early years of their marriage. Um, in terms of her relationship with Vladimir Moknev, her coach. And he cheats on her by informing the World Anti-Doping Agency about her doping. So there's a kind of a, a, you know, a mutual betrayal, if you like. And, and yes, you know, they, they, they come on, they get to the verge of divorce, very close. But, but really the question almost is like, why do they ever get married in the first place? And, and, and when Vitaly started telling me this, I'm thinking, it's all right him telling me, but when, when it's written down and then he's got to reread it because he speaks fluent English, is he going to think, no, this is too much? Or is he going mm. to still go with it? So I was always aware that, that Vitaly and Yulia might pull the plug on that side of it, but they're actually, they're very different. I think, it's partly because they're Russian, they're different to you and I, and they don't see, they don't see the truth in, the, in their private lives as something that they should lie about or hide or conceal. They were, I wouldn't say they're happy to have it out there, but they believed it was necessary to tell the story honestly. And Vitaly's thing would be, if you're going to try and tell the truth about other people, you better be prepared to tell the truth about yourself. And mm. even if, it presents their relationship in a, you know, in a very negative way. Now, it ended up well, but they went mm. through really bad times, as, as you will know from having read the book. Yeah, they sure did. And in many ways, they deserve a book like this because quite often when you hear the names and sport moves on so quickly and the Stepanova's names will always be there for the bravery and the risk that they took in exposing the full extent of the state-sponsored doping program that was in Russia. But that can be quite a one-dimensional thing. Their names, they're two Russians, and everyone moves on with their lives. Whereas actually this brings a depth to their character and shows just what they had to go through to get to the stage, both personally in their own relationship and their own upbringings and some of the difficulties that they have. And also, as you say, the risks they went through to expose this story that there's a depth to this that actually the world needs to hear about and a depth to these people that the world deserve to hear about. Yes, absolutely. Because um, when you say, you know, they met, you know, on a Sunday evening in Moscow, she was on her way to a race in France and they sit in the car and they have their first conversation while they eat a takeaway. And when you present that scene, it's, it's quite romantic and it's quite kind of attractive. Here you have the anti-doping zealot who's, who is, at this point, he's about, 
15 months into his career at the Russian anti-doping agency. He joined that agency on the day it opened. He was there working for weeks, even a few months, getting no pay. And eventually when the funding came, he gets paid. Um, but he's unwavering in his commitment to clean sport. He is the incorruptible, uncool, kind of nerdy type. And he meets this attractive 800 meter runner and they have a date. And it's really attractive to be, you know, to, to think of this, these two people are going to come together and be whistleblowers. But actually, she's committed to doping. And she believes that the system in Russia can never be changed because too many powerful people and powerful institutions right up to President Putin level are, are backing and supporting this system. So she thinks, she looks at this guy sitting in the driver's seat of the car as they eat their takeaway. And, and she thinks, you are an idiot if you think you're going to change. And probably she's thinking, the guy's an idiot, full point. Mm. No, for even considering this. And he thinks, well, what you're telling me is, is painting a situation that's much worse than I imagined it to be. But you know what? I can use what you're telling me to launch an investigation. But I'd also like to have another date with you. And, and it, is kind of, it is kind of romantic to think of that. And it's lovely to think two people from either end of the kind of doping spectrum coming together and falling in love. But actually, that's the romantic view. The realistic mm. view is this was a marriage that really should not have happened. She didn't love him at the point they got married. He definitely was, had fallen in love with her. He'd been really attracted to her. And that love would absolutely endure. But she married him for probably not the right reasons uh, in that she was trying to spite her boyfriend, who was her coach, to try and say to the boyfriend coach, you know, you'd better leave your wife because if you don't, I'm going to marry this guy and I will marry this guy and basically F you. And of course, the coach has a different view. The coach thinks, oh, if you get married to this, this nerdy anti-doping guy, you'll stop annoying me about leaving my wife, and, oh, but we can still carry on, which is what happens. Mm. Um, but that's not a pleasant place for Vitaly to be in because he's no, got a wife sure. who's cheating on him. And it's not a great place for Yulia either because she's married to this guy who's an anti-doping zealot and everybody in her world hates him and they think he's a nuisance and they think he's a problem. So she's constantly getting negative feedback about him and she thinks he's making her life far more difficult than it needs to be because people are kind of a little bit hostile towards her because of her husband. So it's a marriage that's not working for either of them for the first two, three years of its existence. I know they say opposites attract, but these two <laughs> took it to a, an extreme level. And you've gone through there what type of character Vitaly was, a very straight-laced man, man of principle. And then you have Yulia, who was this athlete who, like all Russian athletes, has turned out doped with impunity for years, an incredibly tough upbringing in Kursk, in this remote part of Russia, father an alcoholic, very abusive to her mother, and just desperate to get out and had this dream. And so the only way of getting out was to be a runner, to be an athlete. Just how good an athlete was she? Oh, she was pretty good. But, but as Yulia would say herself, she was, she was, she was a 205, 800 meter runner without drugs. She was 159 with, if she was using EPO. And if she had the benefit of EPO and she was in an Olympic final, well, 159 could win you an Olympic gold medal. It could certainly get you an Olympic medal. So she was right at, at the elite end. I mean, she really dreamed that she was going to go to London 2012. An injury stopped her getting there. But she believed she could go to London and, and, and win a medal. No question. I mean, she'd reached the world indoor final. She'd reached the European indoor final. She was a... And she got bronze medal at the Europeans. I mean, she was an, she was an elite athlete on the way up. And uh, she had a couple of bad performances in finals. And they kind of undermined the trust that her coaches had mm. in her. You know, you lose, you lose favor in Russia if you don't perform in the biggest, in the biggest events. And they had, because they had such a, an effective doping program, they had a, a small army of... 800, 1500 meter women runners who, you know, they could have, they could have, I mean, 
you go back on the videos of, of 800 World Championship, 800 meters finals, Olympic finals, there was virtually always three Russians in the final, in the women's. Yeah, they had an incredible level of dominance and the pressure of trying to get into those three women in the finals weighed very heavily on Yulia. And she speaks a lot as to the basically out that athletics can provide from the life that she had. Vitaly then, and there's a lot of, say, contradictions in their relationships. And even when you finish reading the book as to how you feel about the two of them. So he was one of the first employees of Rosada, which essentially was a facade for anti-doping in Russia. But he was a man of real conviction who firmly believed in anti-doping. And you come away from this book firmly believing that he did believe that. Yet at the same time, he was married to a doper and stuck by a doper. How, how did he weigh that up in his own head? Well, he would have said, yes, I've fallen in love with Yulia. I believe to a degree she's made her own choices in relation to doping. But also, if you want to be an athlete in Russia, this is what you have to do. And he would have understood that. Um, he would have satisfied his conscience by saying that when I inform um, the World Anti-Doping Agency about the corruption going on in Russia, I don't exclude my wife. In other mm. words, I, I tell them I am I am married to to Yulia Rosanova, who is an elite 800 meter runner, and she is part of Russia's doping system. And you know, he eventually got Yulia to write a long letter to WADA, where she detailed while she was still doing it. She detailed the level of doping that she was doing, the amounts, the the, the regime, and she gave WADA that chapter and verse. Now, she did that because she wanted the World Anti-Doping Agency to see, this is how we do it in Russia. I'm just, mm. one, athlete. I'm just one athlete, um, um, but this is what I get. And for me, read every Russian elite athlete. And the World Anti-Doping Agency at one point, like bizarrely, they basically got in touch with um, IDTM in Sweden and said, we need you to go and test a Russian athlete. Yulia, Yulia being the one athlete they want to test it. And Vitaly is thinking, okay, I've given them the information. Now, I didn't say you can't come and test my wife, but I wouldn't like to think that you were just going to target my wife and that was mm. your only response. But that was, at that time, that was Wada's only response to go and try and test Yulia. But of course, what Wada didn't understand, they were wasting their money. The woman who ran the IDTM program, the IDTM who were the Swedish drug testing company, the woman who ran their operation, the Russian woman who ran their operation in Moscow, was completely corrupt and in, in league with the authorities. So they were able to arrange for the test to be done on Yulia at a time when, you, when Yulia was clean. And, uh, and, and that, was the, that was the system. But I think Fatali's thing was, yeah, this is the woman I've married. This is the yeah. woman who's my wife. I respect her as my wife. I've tried to persuade her not to dope. She doesn't believe that she can survive without doping. She's continuing. And I'm telling you, this is, she's a good example of what's going on in Russia. So it wasn't that he ever tried to conceal what she was doing from the authorities. And I thought, you know, he was, you know, his, to me, as a kind of a whistleblower of integrity, his credentials are unimpeachable. I mean, people will say, but Yulia used to dope. Yes, she mm. did. She was in a particular situation in Russia where she was convinced that was the only way forward. And in a way, it was in Russia. But when she converted to Vitaly's side, she became a, a very, you know, strong, aggressive, courageous anti-doping campaigner. Just to give a sense of where they were around 2010, 2011, because that's probably around the time that Vitaly started talking more and more to WADA. He'd been to Vancouver, to the Winter Olympics. He'd met quite a few people through that and had started sending emails. And as you say, spoke about his own wife within that. But at the same time, Yulia is very much thinking about London 2012 and is on a doping program, albeit there's, it turns out, various layers of doping programs within rushing sport. There's the gold standard, silver standard, bronze standard. She wasn't quite at the gold standard at this stage. Throughout all this, but she knows right from that very first day, there, they're brutally honest with each other throughout all this. She knows he has this, and she describes it, this hard-to-fathom idealism around doping. Did she not 
worry and suspect that Vitali was going behind her back to WADA with details of what she was doing and that that is why the Swedish authorities turn up at her door. Well, did that never concern her that she was that close to this man who had such influence in anti-doping? Yeah, well, it did concern her. And she would constantly say to him, she would use the expression, Vitaly, you're ruining my life with this anti-doping stuff. You know, the coaches don't trust me properly because of you. They don't like to see you around at the training camps. You want to come and spend time with me. They don't want you there. I prefer if, if you didn't come. And in terms of his kind of reporting on her, I don't think they ever spoke about that from my questioning of, of Vitaly and Yulia, but I think she presumed that he wasn't hiding what she was doing because she knew that he was so straight-laced, he wouldn't be dishonest about it because, because the World Anti-Doping Agencies would soon have realized that Vitaly was married to an 800-meter uh, elite runner. So they would have wondered about her. So in a way, he preempted that by admitting that she was part of the doping system. Now, Vitaly... Um, Yulia would have thought, you know, my husband is a bit of a square. He's like crazy if he thinks he's going to be able to change this. But there would have been some element, smallish probably, of admiration for the fact that her husband was standing up for the truth. Because in a way, um, and, and what I've come to realize or come to believe about Yulia, I think she's basically a really good person. I think she got caught up in a, uh, she was part of a very difficult um, kind of family situation. You mentioned her, her dad being um, physically abusive to Yulia's mother. He was also physically abusive to, to Yulia and to Yulia's two sisters. He ended up murdering Yulia's grandfather, whom she loved. He, he murdered his father-in-law. He, he was given an eight-year prison sentence for that. And it was a really difficult environment. And she ends up maybe, I, I mean, I don't think it's, it's amateur psychology on my behalf, but if you were to suggest that she might have, you know, been looking for a father figure in her life, well, that would easily explain her relationship with her coach who was 30 years older, older than her. So mm. I, I think you've got to, in a way, be sympathetic to the situation that, that, that Yulia found herself in. But, but when, I, when I talk about her having a kind of, even though she was part of the doping program, I believe that she had some integrity and she had a desire to, 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 for the world to be a better place. I mean, when it came to the family dilemma of basically our father is on trial for murder. Mm. He murdered a man we all loved. Now, what do we do? Well, the family all say they don't want to testify against him except Yulia. She said, I would really like to testify against our dad because I know what he was like. Her sisters and her mum were afraid that when, when dad came out of prison, he would remember if anybody testified against him. So they were afraid. She wasn't. There was an amazing scene at the 2011, after the 2011 World Championships. Yulia made the final in Daegu at the IAAF mm. World Championships. In the semi-final, which Yulia won, um, the English athlete, Jenny Meadows, um, didn't make the final. She was pipped by an American. First two to qualify, fastest losers. Jenny Meadows missed out by a, a, a tiny fraction. At a Diamond League meeting the following week, Yulia saw Jenny Meadows and her husband walking towards her. And Yulia went over to them, and her English was really rudimentary. But what Yulia said to Jenny Meadows is, look, I just want to say I'm really sorry that you didn't make the final in Daegu. And Jenny Meadows had zero doubt that what Yulia meant was, a lot of us are doped. Mm. You're not doping. I know you're not doping. And the reason why Yulia knew that is none of the Russian athletes were allowed to do Diamond League because you get tested every meeting. Now, how can you have a program going if you're being, being tested every week by people who are interested in catching you? And Jenny Meadows won the Diamond League that year. She was the best 800 meter on the circuit. And you, you knew anybody who's running Diamond League every, every time there's a Diamond League meeting is clean. And, and Jenny Meadows felt it was an incredibly sad situation that this Russian athlete she met was kind of had, was affected by the remorse of seeing a clean athlete being denied a place in a final. 
that, in many ways, is the big conflict of this book. And what an awful lot of people will take away and question is the sympathy for dopers. And that story really stood out about Jenny Meadow because Jenny Meadow ends up missing out on the 2012 London Games at the very last minute for Team GB and all that went with the glory of Super Saturday and those brilliant, albeit very much tainted nights in London right now. And Yulia was a cheat. All these Russians, every single one of them were cheats and they cheated so many clean medal, clean athletes out of medals. They cost clean athletes their livelihoods, whether it was through sponsorship, through grants. People had their dreams destroyed because these Russian athletes cheated. And then on the other side, it's impossible not to feel sympathy for Yulia when you read this. Like she's talking about running, giving her things that an ordinary civilian couldn't give her. And so we have one story here and every single Russian who doped has a story and has gone through some form of hardship, but still they cheated. Still the innocent victims of this are the athletes who were clean. And you obviously know this personal story. Is there an acceptance of Yulia, of what they have done and the damage that she caused to other people who, who are totally innocent in all of this? Oh yeah, from Yulia, definitely. You know, she, she totally, um, you know, looks back on her, on her athletic life with shame really, um, but also with a kind of um, a horrible realization that she was so much better with doping than she was without doping. So even what she achieved, she knows she wouldn't have achieved clean. She accepts that. She definitely accepts the fact that it was wrong. Um, but, you know, Nathan, the big thing for me is that when Yulia was given her two-year ban in early 2013, at a point, you know, that ban came when she was in the Crimea. She was there to get mud treatment to help her recover from injuries. And she's told in the middle of the second week, it's a two-week trip, she goes there on her own, she gets the treatment, her, 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 her injuries clear up, she's back running, she's feeling great. She's called up by our new coach, Vladimir Kazarin. And Kazarin tells her, you know, athlete, biological passport, transgression, your irregularities, you're going to get a two-year ban. And she's devastated. And she has three days before she's due to leave. And she starts thinking about her life. What has she got? She's got a husband that she's divorced. They've gone and signed the papers. One of them has to go back to confirm. They decide, because they were so convinced that, that a divorce was the best thing, that they would go back as a couple and sign again, and that's it, they're divorced. Uh, relationship over. She's got um, coaches that she believed in who basically screwed her up because they gave her the drugs. She fails uh, athlete biological passport kind of tests Mm. And now she's going to get a two-year ban. And what's she going to do for the two years? Well, when she puts that question to her coaches, they say, look, do what every Russian woman does when she gets a ban. Start your family. And she's thinking, but I don't have a husband anymore. I'm about to divorce him. And she's got three days and she starts looking at her life almost from the outside because she's no longer in the athletic bubble because she's been kicked out. And when she looks at her life, she sees a woman who's actually made a complete mess of things. She thinks mm. about the coach she had the relationship with. Like, would he have been as interested in her if they didn't have a relationship? She thinks about the, the, Alexei Melnikov, the Russian national coach, who basically wants her because she might win medals and that reflects well on him. And he organizes her doping. He, he helps to organize that she will never test positive. She looks at Kazar and her new coach. What does mm. he want? He wants a, a new champion. So all these men, you know, starting from her dad, through all these Russian officials, they're all using her for their ends. The one guy who is, hasn't, is Vitaly. He's the one good guy, mm. but she's the guy that he's the guy he's the guy whose love she never reciprocated. He he's the guy that she never truly bought into, and now she realizes he's the only one who's properly cared for her and loved her. So she calls him up when she's in the Crimea. And but she only gets there, David, because she's been called. And that's one of the other questions coming out of this. So very quickly, as you say, in the space of 48, 72 hours, herself and Vitaly, who had been within basically a divorce office, been open and of getting divorced, that they start to rekindle the relationship and she starts to turn. 
But that only happens because she was caught. If she hadn't yeah. been caught, if she hadn't got that two-year ban, would she have ever seen the light? That probably not. Maybe she. No, no, she wouldn't. If if that ban doesn't come, they get divorced. They go their separate ways. Mm. And Vitali then doesn't become. So is she, is she this hero if it took a ban to get her to yeah. see the, the well, other way? The the reason why I see her as a hero is because twofold. I think deep down, Vitali always understood. Sorry, Yulia always understood that Vitali was a really good man, and that his integrity was something that you could believe in and it would be sustained and it would be unwavering. I think she knew that. She wasn't particularly attracted to him. I think she could see he was a really good guy. But she'd had this experience when she was a young athlete suffering from uh, the after effects of getting TB. And she mm. went to this, this kind of faith healer in Kurchatov, a city about one hour's bus, bus, bus journey from Kursk where she lived. And she, she gets there two hours before her appointment and she waits and waits. And she eventually sees this woman. She walks into a room and there's all the religious icons. And the woman tells her, um, you know, first says, what's your problem? And Yulia says she doesn't feel great. And, and she wants, she's a professional athlete, a runner, and she needs to get back 100%. And basically what Yulia is saying to her is, what's in my future? And the woman says, I don't think you should be a runner because I don't think this is going to make you happy. I see it plowed over one of your lungs. And Yulia mm. thought that was amazing because she'd actually had TB, but she hadn't told the woman anything about her TB. And Yulia buys into this totally because what the woman says to her is, there is a man who will hold out his hand to you. And if you give yourself to this man, you will be happy. You will have two kids with him and you will find he's a very good man. And when Yulia is in the Crimea and she's at her lowest possible point, she goes back to that woman, uh, back to the memory, because the reason why Yulia was so struck by what the woman said, there was an element of cynicism in Yulia's thinking, even when going to see her. And she thought, these people tell you what you want to hear. This woman had told Yulia exactly what she did not want to hear. The woman, Yulia said to her, but am I not going to have a great career? Mm. And the woman said, no, I don't see you being a really success, you'll have some success, but not much. And when Yulia is in the Crimea and she's, she now has a doping ban, that thought of what that woman said comes back to her. So I think there was an element in Yulia of wanting what was right, but she needed the ban to take running away so she could see what she was to some degree inclined to do anyway. But the reason, Nathan, that I see her as a hero, as the hero of this book, is that when it came to bringing down Russia, Vitaly couldn't do it. Mm. Only Yulia could do it. She was the person who was friends with Alexei Melnikov, the head national coach, who was, who was working with, with Vladimir Kazarin, who was friends with all the other women 800 meter runners, who was not really friendly, but knew Sergei Portugalov, the cynical chief medical officer who was the godfather of doping in Russia. Yulia knew all these people. And she walked into their offices or went, went for kind of social walks with them. She taped them, she videoed them. She put her life at risk to get the evidence. Without the evidence, there is no Russian doping scandal. Yeah, the book does flip on that and that moment when she seems to have this awakening and turns from being a, a very fascinating analysis of them personally and their relationship to this, I think as you described, a bit of a thriller where they go through this process of meeting Hajo Seppelt, becoming part of the documentary, agreeing to become whistleblowers, and then the risks, as you said, that Yulia needs to put her through to get on the record with secret recordings from all these top officials within Russia. How worried were they at that period for their safety? Because like, you write at the time about Nikita Kamayev, who was a director with Rusad, and he'd actually been in touch with you, and maybe if you were writing the Russian doping book, it would have been with him, he writes to you about becoming a whistleblower and about writing a book. And then suddenly three months later, he drops dead from a heart attack despite being a very fit man at 52. Bakislav Sinev, who was Vitaly's boss at Rusada and quite figures quite prominently during the book, he also mysteriously drops dead around a similar time. Like Russia, an action was being taken against those who were trying to out what was happening. W were they seriously concerned for their safety? I, I think they, they knew that they knew that what was going to be in the documentary and they knew they couldn't be in Russia. If they'd stayed in Russia, 
I, I don't think it, I don't think both of them would be alive today if they tried to brazen it out in Russia. They had to leave Russia, guaranteed. I mean, loads of threats on their lives. You mentioned Nikita Kamayev and and Vyacheslav Sinev, who died in that um, February 20, 2016, within 12 days of each other. Both of them died suddenly. Both of them are former bosses of the Russian anti-doping agency. On Sunday, their successor as head of the Russian anti-doping agency, Yuri Ganis, put out a statement saying that he will not commit suicide. So if anything happens to him, he wants the public to know that he did not commit suicide. He said, mm. I am in love with life. I've got a zest for life. He said, any notes that are purported to have been written by me as a suicide note, I will not have written them. Now, Ganis is, is at loggerheads with, with the Russian Olympic Committee, who are kind of aligned to the government, and they want to fight Russia's current four-year ban. Yuri Ganis is the head of Russian anti-doping agency saying, look, we cheated. We should take our punishment. Now, the Kremlin hates that message. The Russian Olympic Committee hate that message. They brought out a report trying to show that, that Ganis was has been involved in all kinds of financial irregularities with, with, the, um, with the Russian anti-doping agency. That report basically is fictitious. Um, Vitaly Stepanov, of course, typical Vitaly, he went through that report line for line and he said the, the stuff they're claiming against, uh, against Ghanis. And Ghanis then brought out a report, a response to that. And he said, you read the two and you realize the Russian Olympic Committee report is a complete joke, an attempt mm. to assassinate Ghanis's character. And, but and, and, but, but Ghanis is, is so afraid of what happens next, he sees fit to bring out this statement saying, I am not intending to commit suicide, which is like, I mean, and that's today. This is, this is five and a half years, more, almost six years after Hayo Seppo's documentary came out. Yeah, the timelines across a lot of this are interesting. And over the last five, six years, I think everybody has looked at sport in a different way and realized that those who we thought were there to protect the sport weren't always in that position. And it's interesting, I was reading some of the letters that you published from Vitali to WADA, and I was thinking back to a scene towards the end of Icarus, that documentary that I'm sure an awful lot of people have seen, uh, which ends up taking in the Russian doping scandal. And Brian Fogel, the documentary maker, he arranges this meeting with several high-ranking members of WADA and basically on Gregory Rachenko's behalf, who was running the Moscow lab, he brings Wada through chapter and verse of Russian doping over the last 40 years, right down to exactly what every Russian athlete was taking in the build-up to London 2012. And the reaction in the room, and it's such a striking image from everybody, from Wada, from the athletes' representatives, is just total shock, disbelief, and disgust. And that meeting was in May 2016. Yet, in this book, you've published emails from Vitaly to Stuart Kemp of WADA from 2010, where he starts to give a clear insight into the depth of the doping program within Russian athletics, including hanging his own wife out to dry within those. And those emails continue for months and for years. So how then, when it comes to 2016, can WADA officials be so shocked by what they're hearing about Russia? Yes, absolutely. Um, it was like WADA didn't want to believe what Vitaly was telling them, and they certainly didn't want to engage with Vitaly, not the top people. I mean. Um, I could tell you a story. And, and David Harmon was director general of WADA. And I've known David Harmon for years, and he's a really good guy. And I think he overall did a pretty decent job at WADA. And David Harmon um, uh, didn't ever engage with Vitaly on a one-to-one -one basis. When Vitaly, and all these emails are going to Stuart Kemp. They obviously get passed upwards. I mean, Stuart Kemp is not going to say, I'm getting emails from a guy who works for the Russian anti-doping agency. He says the whole system in Russia is corrupt without telling people. And there were mm. meetings, you know, in you mentioned Vancouver at the Winter Olympics where Vitaly meets some senior water people and he outlines to them in person. But remember, Vitaly speaks pretty... He had spent five years in America as a teenager. So he speaks pretty fluent English and he's given them a full account. But... It, their problem is that under the rules they've got, they can't actually go, what, what, if you say that a country has got a, uh, a systematic pro doping program 
for all its athletes pretty much. Well, the next step for WADA, if they find that out, is to go to the National Anti-Doping Agency in that country. So WADA should have gone to Rusada and said, look, we believe all your guys are doping. Can you launch an investigation? Mm. That's what the but, protocols said should happen. But of course- but That would have been worthless. Worthless, and it would have endangered Vit- Vitaly's life. So mm. WADA were concerned about Vitaly's life. There's no doubt they were worried that if they made a wrong move, Vitaly was in trouble. But they didn't actually try to make the right move. They didn't sit with Vitaly and say, look, Vitaly, tell us, how can we do this? If we were to get you out of Russia, could we then go in and say, we we now need to change everything here because we know from Russian anti-doping agency, young guy, um, they didn't. They were basically looking the other way. They were hoping this problem wasn't as bad as Vitaly said. They were hoping it would somehow go away. And there was a... It was a, a, a How could they be so naive? If, if Jenny Meadows in 2011 to 2012 is looking at Yulia and, and realising and understanding what is going on, like, is it naivety? Is it a sleep at the wheel? Is it an organisation not fit for purpose? Are they willfully ignorant? Because, again, one of the things you see is, like Craig Reedy, who was WADA's president, how much he valued his relationship with Vitaly Mutko, the infamous Russian minister for sport at the time, that even after... Hadjil Seppel's documentary still wants to maintain that relationship. So friendship. It, fr- uh, friendship, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, where do you uh, fall down in that? Yeah, I, I fall down. You, you mentioned different scenarios there. The one that I think is the most um, apt is willful ignorance. Um, I, I turn to, to think of it as good, you know, basically good people looking the other way. And mm. it, when, whenever there's a scandal or whenever there's corruption going on, I believe, generally speaking, it can't happen unless good people look the other way. And, and sometimes, of course, it is difficult to ask questions. I mean, Vitaly saw the people coming from, coming from WADA to visit um, um, Rusada in Moscow. And when they came, they would be taken on trips around the office and shown the numbers. You know, this is how many people were testing. This is how many positives we got. And the WADA guys would nod. And, and the, the Rusada top officials would make sure that Vitaly wasn't around. Because if any of the WADA guys had said to Vitaly, oh, you, you, we believe you speak English, and how do you, how, what do you think of the situation? Well, Vitaly would have said to them, everybody dopes in this country, you've got to understand mm. it. But he was kept out of the way. And the WADA officials, like they, to put it politely, they believed too easily the bullshit they were being told by the Russians. Um, but it, it's, it's just that thing of, I'm in a position of power here. I kind of suspect that, those guys over there are corrupt. But if I take them on, it's going to make my life very difficult. And I'm not sure that I really have the means. And you know what? If I just don't deal with it, it might go away. And, and that underpinned what is approached for four years. And if it weren't for Jack Robertson, the mm. investigator who was, a, who was a good guy, who'd had a long and very successful career with the Drugs Enforcement Agency, DEA in America. And Jack Robertson thinks, I've had dealings with Hayo Seppelt, a really good investigative journalist. If I get Hayo Seppelt to do something with Vitaly and Yulia, it may be that we'll be forced to have an investigation. So it was Wada's chief investigator who suggested going down the journalistic route. And it's a, maybe a, a credit to the journalistic profession that Jack Robertson saw that as a way to go. The, the journalist makes the documentary. Hayo Seppel made a very good mm. documentary. And then the pressure comes on the World Anti-Doping Agency to investigate. And that's what happened. Craig Reedy had been hoping that Hayo Seppel's documentary wouldn't cause the waves it caused and that he could deal with it in a private way and nobody would ever know that Russia was being slapped on the wrists. I know there have been some changes to the way anti-doping has been run in recent years, but like you describe this as the greatest sporting scandal. And in many ways, it comes about through just a series of very fortunate events that Vitaly, who's this ardent doper, meets Julia, this doper who come together in a fleeting moment, bizarrely two and a half weeks later get engaged and a couple of months later are married. They hate each other's guts, try and get divorced, but because of the divorce office is shut, it ends up not <laughs> happening and many, many various different twists of fate, and we end up with full knowledge of this Russian doping scandal. 
and all that needs to happen is for one of those to fall through. And if, they, if, if one of those things had fallen through, do you think we'd be sitting here in 2020 without knowledge of what was going on in Russia? Totally. We would, you're absolutely right. You know, when there were times, as you say, when Vitaly and Yulia went around to the divorce office and it was closed. So in a way, that meant a postponement an adjournment of the hostilities until they would go back to the divorce office again. If one of those earlier visits to the divorce office had found the divorce office open, they would have, they would have um, um, got their divorce, Yuli would have continued, there would be absolutely no Russian doping scandal. Because Vitaly on his own would have been impossible for him to achieve anything. Because they would have said, look, he's a lowly disgruntled former employee of Rosada, making up kind of, you know, bullshit stories about, about his, his former colleagues. And none of it is true. And Vitaly wouldn't have had a scintilla of evidence. Because mm. the only evidence that works with the people who are involved in Russia's, in this cons- Russian conspiracy to cheat, the only evidence that works is tapes and videos, you know, of these people saying, this is the amount of drugs I want you to take. Um, this is, this is the, the video of Kazarin counting out the tablets for Yulia. That's the kind of evidence you needed. And only Yulia could get that evidence. And in terms of where WADA are now and the investigations they can put in place at this moment in terms of other countries, because it is easy to blame the big bad wear that is Russia and, for, and lots of countries are more than happy to do it, to throw everything at Russia and hope that the rest of the world can move on. But like, you only have to look at the Daily Mail last weekend about Britain and 2012 and this wonder drug that was being given to athletes with no questions asked. Are WADA starting to go into countries? Are they going doing investigations that will reap rewards? Or is it still just totally hit and miss? No, I mean, no, the rules did change. And, and the timing of the uh, higher separate investigation wasn't accidental. WADA knew that from January 1st, 2015, under the new WADA code, they had the right to just go and investigate a country. They didn't have to go to that country's um, anti-doping, national anti-doping agency and ask them to conduct the review. They could then do it. Um, Are WADA fit for purpose now? I think they do, if I were were listing what they do out of 10, I'd give them about 4.5. Right. They don't even get to five now because they're just not aggressive enough. They're just not, they're just not, you know, I'd say Jack Robertson used to say that the, 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 the funding was always an issue for the investigative unit. And Jack Robertson was always asking his bosses at WADA to, to give him a couple of new investigators because he was working on his own. He, he was dealing with throat cancer and he was spending incredibly long hours in the office. And they would say, sorry, Jack, we just don't have, we don't have the funds. But then funding would come, and new people mm. would turn up in other departments, and Jack's department never got that, because Wada didn't really want to put resources into investigating other countries. And that's why, that's why they would deserve a, 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 a 4 or a 4.5. But, but it should also be said that when HIO's documentary came, Wada organized... It's, you know, it's set up, it's, in, it, it's, it's independent investigation, first under Dick Pound, a later one under Richard McLaren. And those reports were, were very strong and, and didn't spare Russia and have led to Russia getting a four-year ban. Yeah, and Mother Russia doesn't take that sort of shame lightly. And we've gone through some of the victims coming out of this. You've obviously spent a lot of time with the Stepanovs putting this book together and they end up trying to start a new life for themselves in America. Are they able to live freely and without fear right now? Yeah, yeah. I, um, Vitaly says that, that he and Yulia, um, well, Robert is only six, um, that they feel pretty safe where they are. Um, I suppose, you know, if you were Vladimir Putin and you looked at what had happened in relation to sport, you, you, uh, maybe I'm being incredibly naive here, but I feel Putin would have a certain amount of admiration for what Vitaly did because he was so damn straight and he was so unwavering in his commitment to the truth. And he would, he would have a certain admiration, I think, for Yulia having made her road to Damascus conversion to anti-doping, then having the, 
having the balls to walk into all the, the offices of all those high ranking officials and taping and videoing them. Um, but where Putin would have a real problem is with um, Grigory Rochkinkov. Because Rochkinkov was like probably the key man of the whole system. Mm. He was he was he was the kind of the doping overlord. He was the doping godfather, head of the anti-doping lab. He could make tests disappear. He could get people positive if he wanted to. He could keep them negative if he wanted to. He was giving them drugs. He had a side business making money, extorting money from athletes. He does all of this. And when they move him sideways, as they felt they had to after the, invest the Richard McLaren's uh, um, investigation in 2015, when they move him aside, he defects to America and becomes a whistleblower in chief. So I'd say the antagonism in Russia would be much more directed at Rochinkov than the Stepanovs, because the Stepanovs were just like small people. You know, I likened them to a mosquito. They were small, but they but they had a sting. And uh, mm -hmm. they did achieve a lot, but 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 Rochenkov was so much part of the system. The fact that he then betrayed the system would go down seriously badly in high places in Russia. Yeah, and I think that comes across as well towards the end of Icarus, just how much threat is on his life. Uh, David, it's been great to talk to you. The Russian affair, the true story of the couple who uncovered the greatest sporting scandal. It's out today. Uh, best of luck with it. It's a great read. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Nathan.